Good morning. We're going to start with our gathering hymn, the Psalter hymnal, the red hymnal, number 183, Oh, that I had a thousand voices. So greetings to, uh, welcome to the Lord's Worship at Calvin Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I see some unfamiliar faces. Welcome if you're visiting us, and I pray that you enjoy the Lord uh, along with us as we enjoy Him together in His worship. What is the chief end of man? To and enjoy Him forever. Well, we're enjoying Him this morning. We enjoy Him in our meals. We enjoy Him in our walks. We enjoy Him in one another. And we enjoy Him in a special way in His worship. And we will come to that momentarily. First, a few announcements. Um, you can see in your bulletin there, uh, Presbytery meets this coming Saturday, Friday, Saturday, in uh, Southern California. So uh, please pray for traveling for everyone. Um, I will not be able to be there, but, uh, but uh, uh, Pastor Babcock will be. And uh, so, uh, and, and then the, the, the business of the presbytery, the, uh, uh, our, our uh, sister church, uh, Providence OPC in Scottsdale, uh, will be what we call particularized at the meeting. Uh, so we pr uh, pray for them as well, uh, Pastor Sheck Schneider and uh, the new elders that will be appointed. So pray for that. Uh, we, have the, we had the North Valley Fellowship uh, at the uh, Babcocks last night, which was just a delightful time. This coming Saturday, we'll have the East Valley Fellowship 
uh, down in, uh, at the Baker's home, so that's down in uh, uh, Gilbert, uh, in that area, so, so uh, enjoy that. And then uh, Friday the 27th, that would be uh, uh, next, next Friday, um, the last Friday of the month, uh, College and Careers will meet at the Owens home, and, um, and then youth group uh, on the following night. Uh, and you see in your bulletin here uh, the announcement for the Prescott uh, youth, uh, Fall Youth Camp. All the information is there. One more thing, we're having a membership class, uh, a very fully attended class, I'm happy to say, uh, starting next Sunday in the Sunday School with Pastor Babcock. Uh, so um, uh, that as well. Uh, let's uh, prepare our hearts now as we come to the Lord's worship. Good morning. It is a truly a blessed thing to be with you today, as I trust that uh, you came this morning anticipating meeting with God and being blessed in, in his presence. It's good to have Pastor uh, David back. He was away for a short while uh, at a conference and then where he spoke, and then also visiting family up in Canada. He was uh, blessed uh, he, he, I'm kind of envious because Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, and uh, he got he gets to have two things. He does uh, Canadian Thanksgiving, and uh, next month ours. Well, anyway, uh, we are here to worship the living God. There is nothing sweeter. There is nothing better than that because, as the Catechism was read, this is the very purpose for which we are made. God made us that we might have fellowship with him. God uh, created us that we might worship him and find our fullest expression of life in him. And so today is a great day because he has also promised in a very special covenantal way to meet with us as people and to, to fill us with his joy, to remind us that we are citizens of heaven the best day of the week. Let's stand now as he calls us and to worship him. And into his presence we come with joy. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And let us shout joyfully, joyfully to him with psalms. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, you truly are the only wise God, the almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God. Your wisdom, your power, your holiness, justice, goodness, and truth are, are constantly displayed before us, and our heart rejoices that you are a God of love and mercy, that you are a God of righteousness, Lord, we come today to worship you. We thank you for all your perfections. We, we rejoice in your great glory. Our desire truly is to worship you, to give you the honor and the glory due your name. So, Lord, do fill this house this morning with your glory. Let the foundations tremble before you. Fill our hearts with the joy of your salvation and the peace that comes from waiting on you, 
our one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you, even through our rock and our redeemer, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us take up our Psalter hymnals, turning to number 84b, Psalm 84b, and we will sing to his praise. if you noticed uh, that verse that says from strength to strength advancing they on their journeys go till each appears in Zion where they their God behold it is an interesting thing as you go on a journey the more you go the tireder you become the less strength you have but here in, in, in our pilgrimage we advance from strength to strength because we advance with the Holy Spirit's help and his protection and guidance of the... And it's a wonderful thing to know that, that we march through the deserts, not only with our God, but with the whole church. Uh, we, we come to Zion 
where there are the holy angels, the apostles, the martyrs, and all the holy saints that have been perfected by grace. They're all there now, and we have joined them in their worship. Uh, so with that in mind, let us turn to page 851. As we recite the Apostles' Creed, again, this, this creed of the church that binds our hearts to all other Christians, not just around the globe today, but down throughout the ages. So what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. But in your bulletin, you'll see that uh, gold piece of paper. One hand, it's the youth camp announcements, but on the other is the commandment to love the Lord. Seems kind of almost a strange thing to, to command us to love Him, and yet we need that command because our hearts are little idol factories and we constantly go chasing after other gods and other things to love rather than him. So I'll read the bold print if you'd respond in reading the lighter print as we look at this commandment. So hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and hold fast to him and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. So honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Amen. And so we're called here again to love the Lord our God, to love Him supremely. But how do we love ourselves? Or how do we love Him? How do we show Him that we love Him? Well, we, we read the rest of these verses. Delight yourself in the Lord. Observe His commandments. Stay close to Him. Serve Him with your heart. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord. And turn from evil. Honor the Lord from your wealth. 
Don't worry, but seek first the kingdom of God. These are the practical ways that we can show love to our, our loving Father in heaven, who is our God. Do we do these things perfectly? No. Are we inconsistent in our devotion to him? Yes, we are. Inconsistent. Uh, we don't love as we ought. And therefore, we fall short of God's glory. We deserve his wrath, but yet in his love, he holds out mercy. So let's go to him as we would uh, confess our sins and, and look to him for mercy. Let's pray. O oh, most holy and merciful Father, again we acknowledge and confess to you our sinful nature. Indeed, O oh Lord, we must confess that we are prone to evil and we are slow to do good. And yes, O oh Lord, our lives are filled with shortcomings and offenses. In fact, you alone know how often we have sinned. But O oh Lord, you are a God of great mercy. And so we cry out to you yet again for mercy. Cleanse us from our secret faults. Forgive our sins, even for the sake of your dear Son, Jesus. And O oh most holy and loving God, help us by your Spirit, to live in your light and to walk in your ways according to the commandments that you have given to us, even through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, beloved, uh, we have heard God's law. Our hearts have been somewhat convicted by that, I hope, and, and that we see our faults and our failings. We've confessed them. We've asked God for mercy. What is his answer? Please stand with me now as I read these words from Isaiah chapter 44, where God says, Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have wiped out your transgression like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Look up, dear beloved, you who trust in Jesus Christ. Let those words of our God ring in your heart and settle deep in your souls. He has wiped out your transgressions. He has taken care of all your sins and have cleansed you so that you are now pure and holy and righteous in his sight, dressed even in the righteousness of Christ our Lord. That is good news, isn't it? Don't you want to rejoice? Let's turn then to hymn number 498, and let's sing together from our hearts with faith, I will sing of my Redeemer, 498.
please be seated. You who are the redeemed of the Lord, bought by the blood of Christ, set free from all your sins, from the fear of death, brought into the presence of God as sons. Let's turn to him then in prayer as we would lift up petitions to God, as we would intercede for the church around the world. We do so even with this promise from Jesus who said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks, it will be opened. Those are pretty amazing words. They're strong words that if it didn't come from Jesus, it'd be almost hard to believe it, wouldn't it? But yet it's not ask and you may be given, uh, seek and you may find, knock and the door may be opened. No, it will be. That is the promise of your covenant God. And so let us go with boldness to the throne of grace. Let us go in faith with confidence knowing that our Father hears us, He delights in those prayers, and that He will answer in His timing according to His own will. Let's pray. O Lord God, how gracious You are to invite us into Your presence as children. As children. How encouraging, how comforting is Your promise that is that if we but ask, we will receive. If we seek, we will find. And if we knock, yes, You will open the door for us. And so, Father, this morning as we raise our petitions to Your throne of grace, we pray that our hearts and all its inclinations would be cleansed and purified, that all our tastes and desires would be lifted above the things of this world that perish. Indeed, O Lord, we pray that our heart's affections would be delivered from that which would carry us away from you and your will, and that we, O Lord, would be strengthened in our faith, built up to live for you, to give to you the whole of our lives. Grant to each one here a brighter vision of that heavenly reality and cause our souls to hunger for the blessedness of the inheritance that is both imperishable and undefiled, that will not fade away, uh, 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 an inheritance that is reserved in heaven and protected even by your very power. O oh Lord, we thank you, we praise you, But Lord, we remember the people that live around us. We pray for our nation, O Lord, a a nation that is embattled within and without, a culture that is crumbling and is bankrupt. Lord, we mourn that uh, the people of today are becoming more and more estranged from decency and from even sanity, Lord. We are living in a very crazy world, it seems. But Lord, you are the sovereign God. You are still in control of all things. And so it is with great hope that we turn to you in prayer. And so, Lord, with faith, we ask that you would protect our our nation from all its enemies. That you would cause us, O Lord, to repent of our sins as a nation and that we would return even to the Creator who is the God of the days of our youth. Indeed, O Lord our God, we, we pray that you would deliver us from evil, temporal, spiritual, eternal. Lord, that, that you would bring a powerful revival, O Lord. That you would confer upon us your spiritual blessings in great abundance, O Lord, cause our hearts to turn back to you. We pray this for all your people, for all your churches. O Lord, that there be a great revival, a greater interest in your word, a greater desire to live for you, even amidst the craziness that is around us. Build up your church, we pray. Protect her from from the evil one. Build up her unity that she 
would be a greater witness in this world. Oh, Lord, sanctify your people by your word, we pray. And we especially pray for our missionaries, Mark and Jenny Richline in Montevideo, Uruguay. Lord, we ask that you would uh, cause the work of their hands to prosper, that the gospel that, preach, that is preached from Mark would go forth powerfully. Lord, that many souls would be converted and corrected and brought to Christ. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, also bring relief from the drought that they are suffering from, oh, Lord. We pray that their water supplies would be replenished. Grant to them good water and, and great rain, O oh Lord, that they might be refreshed. Bless the Presbytery as it meets on Friday and Saturday, O oh Lord. Cause all the deliberations and all the reports to go smoothly and peaceably, O oh Lord. We pray that your will would be done and that uh, the brothers, Lord, would love one another. Grant safety to all those that are traveling to this. O oh Lord, grant wisdom and grace. Those that are being examined for a licensure, O oh Lord, may they be strengthened and all the things that they have studied be brought to mind. Lord, we also pray that you would enable us to be consistent in our uh, devotion to you. Again, Lord, we thank you for your bounty and all the benefits that you have given to us, even without us asking. We thank you for the many benefits that you have given to an, an answer to our prayers. And Father, as we think of your blessed Son who came not to be served, but to serve, we ask that we would follow in his path and that we ourselves would never become tired in serving others in love. Help us to bear one another's burdens. Help us to be generous, caring for one another, showing hospitality, demonstrating your love to one another. Oh Lord, we pray for the sick that you would heal them, comfort the trouble-hearted, and draw near to those who are going through difficulties and afflictions. We plead these blessings, oh Lord, not because we deserve them, but because of the perfection of your person and because of the promises of your covenant of grace. We praise you that you are a prayer-hearing and prayer-answering God. We ask all these things, even in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, one of the other benefits that we have as Christians, we are to, uh, we are made, remade in the image of Christ and in the image of God, a God who is cheerful and giving, and God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me now in this. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. So this morning, let us give in faith, knowing that the Lord himself gives back to us generously. Deacons, let us uh, come up that we might receive the, God's tithes in our offering. Again, beloved, let's turn to this God in prayer. Oh, Lord, all that we have is from your hand. And by your grace, all that we are is yours. So we offer now these gifts, these offerings. We ask that you would bless them for the building up of your kingdom, for the advancement of your gospel in this world, the reconciliation of sinners, and all, Lord, to the glory of Christ. Amen.
Let's stand together now and we'll sing the doxology. that I'm about to read, for these are the words of the living God himself from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from whence you have fallen and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Amen. May he add his blessings to this. Now please be seated. So we're entering into uh, these uh, little letters that Jesus sends by John to the seven churches in Asia. And in these letters, we're going to see just how much Jesus loves his people. Now, he's going to address their sins and their faults and their failings. But you know something, just as he is faithful to wound, he is also faithful to heal. And so I hope that you're going to see in these letters how loving and how good of a doctor he is. And, and <clears throat> he, he shows himself as a loving and gentle doctor by, by first identifying himself. And, and in this particular letter, he identifies himself as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, he does this not only to remind them of who he is, but to remind them of what they're supposed to be. You see, again, the church is the lampstand. The church is the stars. These are light givers, right? And, and it signifies how we are called to be, as the church, that we're called to be the light to the world. And Jesus' warning in this letter to the Ephesians is similar to what he said in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, where he, where he said to his disciples there, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine among men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. These Ephesian saints were being lethargic in their calling as being light. And so Jesus corrects them in order that that flickering light that they are would fan into a greater light and uh, that others might glorify God. Well, again, before Jesus corrects them, he says to them, I know your deeds and toil and perseverance 
and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and that you put to test those who call themselves apostles but are not, and that you have endured for my name's sake. And then in verse 6, again, he mentions how they also hate the Nicolaitans, which was a, a cult. Uh, the, these Nicolaitans were, were a cult that enticed people to sexual impurity, among other things. And, and so, as, as Jesus talks to his church, he commends them very highly for being pure in doctrine, for being pure in life and in morals. And that's a very high commendation indeed, especially when you understand the city of Ephesus. So let's, uh, so let's uh, try to understand this commendation more by looking at Ephesus for just a few moments. Ephesus, of course, was a very large and important city in that part of Asia, which is now uh, western Turkey. Uh, Ephesus had a large harbor, and, and that resulted in a very strong economy, a very flourishing marketplace. Moreover, the Romans uh, built roads from Ephesus into the inner regions uh, of the country, which connected the Ephesian wealth to distant places, making Ephesus a very important gateway to to uh, into Asia, uh, and and because of its wealth, of course, it attracted all kinds of people, especially teachers of various kinds of philosophies. So it was a very well educated city. Very different kinds of philosophies were being taught in different schools there. So it was also not just a a strong economic place. It was a hub of ideas and of strange teachings of life. But even more than all that, Ephesus also was known for its great temple of Artemis. This, of course, was regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was, it was a, a fantastically looking building, uh, apparently. Uh, it was huge. It was larger than the Acropolis in, in Athens and the Parthenon. It was larger than... It, it, was, uh, it had... 120 60 feet high columns, many of which were gilded. It, it dominated the city skyline. One of the ancient poets of the time, a man by the name of Antipa, uh, Antipater, uh, Antipater of Sidon, uh, wrote, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. It was it was considered just a tremendous wonder. And it was built in honor of the gar, uh, goddess Artemis. Artemis was probably one of the most popular goddesses of the Roman Empire. She was the goddess of the hunt and the goddess of fertility. So part of her worship involved visiting the temple prostitutes. So apart from cultic prostitution, which of course brought a measure of lunacy into that culture, Ephesus also had a huge problem with crime. You see, temples in those days were, were also an asylum. And so criminals would run to this temple in order to hide from the law. And so again, even though Ephesus was very beautiful, it was wealthy, it was a very powerful city, it was also an incredibly immoral city. But because of its beauty, because of its power, the temple attracted so many tourists. So much so that uh, the, the temple actually also became a bank. And it was a source of revenue for all kinds of workers and craftsmen selling their souvenirs. Have you ever been to... Uh, um, the Vatican City, for instance, you go through Rome and you come to the Vatican and, and around the Vatican City, there's all these vendors, all these guys trying to sell their, their souvenirs. Well, it was very similar uh, in, in uh, Ephesus. It was such, uh, the temple was such an economic powerhouse 
that it became something of a public, not just a religious offense, but a public offense to not support it, or the cult of Artemis. In fact, perhaps you'll recall how in Acts chapter 19, when Paul came to Ephesus and preached the gospel and was establishing the church there, certain craftsmen began to complain that Christianity would put an end to the temple. <laughs> and they would lose their prosperity. Well, since Paul founded the church in that lewd city, the Ephesian church stood strong and true against false teaching, against false practices of worship. They val valiantly withstood the strongest influences and pressures of immorality that was prevalent uh, uh, in the city. For 40 years, that church didn't buckle. They remained sexually and doctrinally pure. And, 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 and in his letter here, Jesus com commented how he noticed. He knew them. He saw them. He noticed how the hard they worked in this regard. Again, look at verse 2. I know your works and your toil and your perseverance. He knows how hard they worked. They, were, uh, they had accomplished much during those 40 years of their existence. They, these were not lazy Christians. They diligently undertook the work of evangelism. We, we see that by the fact that uh, there's six other churches that Jesus writes to, all in that area. No doubt they were either planted or at least financially supported by the Ephesian church. That word translated as toil also means a work that is burdensome, a work that is full of distress, a work that is uh, full of discomfort because of difficulties. In other words, their work was arduous, and it met with persecution. They were often under duress. They strained. They strained to remain pure of doctrine and pure of, in their morality, despite the pressures to compromise to the surrounding culture. And in this, my friends, we, we see here a good example of Christian fidelity. Jesus commends them, and, and we should commend them, and we should seek to be like them. And, and, and we need this example. Why? Because the pressures to embrace secular viewpoints is always a strong temptation in the church, isn't it? In fact, uh, just 100 years ago, J. Gresham Machen wrote a wonderful book to address this very issue. His book, Christianity and Liberalism, addresses how easy it is for the church to want to cave in and to embrace secular mindsets and, and viewpoints. He wrote in that book, modern preachers are trying to bring men into the church without requiring them to relinquish their pride. They're trying to help men avoid the conviction of sin. Well, if you don't have a conviction of sin and you're still built up in your pride, you'll never come to a savior. And so you'll build up another kind of savior, as so many have done. You know, Machen, there is warning uh, about, about trying to make Christianity more attractive to unbelievers. The church has been called upon by Christ himself to stand on the principle that Jesus only is the savior. But my friends, he's a holy savior. And with that, we need to remember that salvation is not half of Christ's work and half of our work. No, it is totally Christ's work. Amen. And his work is to, to fully deliver us from sin. And so we need to be pure in our doctrine so that we would present a pure, true Jesus, a, a, a Savior that is able to really save. But of course... The doctrine of salvation is, is often mocked, it's rejected because men want to put themselves into salvation. I've got to do something to earn my, my merit before God. 
the Protestant reformers. We're, we're you know, looking in a couple of weeks uh, at the celebration of the Protestant Reformation, right? The Protestant reformers recovered the doctrine of salvation, a justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, to God's glory alone. They withstood the false teaching of Rome even through persecution and many being put to death. And yet they remain firm and so must you. Because the pressure to buckle, the pressure to compromise, the pressure to, to tarnish the gospel, to create a Jesus that's less than holy, less than mighty, is, is very tempting. It wasn't that long ago that I read an article that was written by a general in the United States Army who, who commented that the number one enemy to the United States is not China, it's not North Korea, it's not Putin. No, the number one enemy to the United States is conservative evangelical Christians. Why? because conservative evangelical Christians have the Bible as their authority. And they will not yield to the claims of other viewpoints. That was his statement. Why can't they accommodate other perspectives? Why can't they embrace a more flexible attitude toward the claims of science over the Bible or with matters such as gender and sexuality? So, some Christians think that that we will attract more people to Christ if we're just a little bit more bendable in these areas, if we can be flexible. But my friends, listen, it's, it's better to be faithful to Christ's expressed word rather than to try to comply with the world's views. Uh, it's better to be faithful to, to the living God than to try to accommodate modern culture. Again, trying to make Jesus a completely inoffensive a savior to men. But Jesus is always going to be offensive to man, isn't he? Jesus himself said, I didn't come to bring priests, but a sword. <laughs> and so again, the church is always faced with, with false teaching. It's always faced with, with practices of worship that are false because pastors have abandoned the historic orthodox doctrine that sees God the omnipotent God, the immutable and holy sovereign. In fact, look at chapter 1 again. Jesus uh, revealed himself to John in that vision, and John wrote, his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a, a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. See, that's, that's the vision of the Jesus who is the Savior, the Jesus who lives. A Savior who is holy, holy, holy. A Savior who is mighty to save. He is attractive in His holiness, isn't He? He is attractive in His righteousness and in His majesty and in His power. And we don't need to try to tarnish His holy, his holy beauty to make Him more attractive to the world. No, it's those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. They will find in him what all their soul craves. And those who are weary and heavy laden will find him to be a gentle uh, savior, humble in heart, and they will find rest and a holy, all-powerful, sin-hating savior. And my friend, listen, it's only a savior like this that will satisfy the depths of the human heart. And if we would like to hear the same commendation that Jesus gave these Ephesians, then we also must learn not to tolerate evil men. We need to put to test those who call themselves apostles but are not. But let's move on because just as much as there is to commend this church, Jesus also says, I have this against you, <laughs> that you left your first love. Even though they had endured in orthodoxy, they forsook their first love. Now, many, of the, uh, many commentators uh, see in that a reference 
to a loss of devotion to Christ. But I think that the devotion to Christ really here isn't the issue. They had proven their devotion, even enduring persecution. I think the problem is that they were so focused on being precise in orthodoxy and orthopraxy that they grew cold towards others. And this is serious. This is very serious. Note how in verse 1 Jesus said that he is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. He is the one who walks among the seven lampstands. Again, the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands represent or they symbolize the church. And here we have this vision that Jesus is in the midst of his churches. He's holding them in his right hand. This is a strong symbolism of his great love for the church. This is a picture, again, again, of Jesus gently and lovingly walking with the saints, even in their trials, holding them up, protecting them, providing for them because of his great love for them. And so this sin that they left their first love caused him grief. These Ephesians, uh, Ephesians, with all their orthodoxy, failed to love those whom Christ loves. They failed to love those for whom Christ died. Now, beloved, this is not far from us. How many of you have heard this particular charge given to Reformed churches? I have heard, especially after General Assembly, of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. How wonderfully, valiantly, Orthodox Presbyterians fight for truth, arguing for hours over a single preposition because that preposition means life or death. We're very, we're very precise in our doctrine. Uh, I've heard that the Orthodox Presbyterian Church has been called the little church with the big mouth. Well, there's some truth to that. But you know what? We love doctrine. And we want to be precise and we want to be accurate in our doctrine because it matters. And we understand how orthodoxy matters. We understand how worship matters. So we'll fight so hard for orthodoxy. But have you never heard that sometimes we are sometimes called God's frozen chosen? That's not a good thing to be called. You want to please Christ with being accurate and pure and sure in your doctrine? Well, that's great. And he is pleased by that. But my friends, listen, if you want to please him, you also must love your brother. And we will be cold if we disconnect doctrine from practice. Doctrine tells us who Christ is. Doctrine tells us all that Christ did to save us. That's why it's important. But the question then remains, why did Christ save us? What did he save us for? Just so that we would be intellectually, doctrinally right? No. Listen to what Jesus actually prayed for in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night that he was betrayed, John chapter 17, you can read the fuller prayer, but listen to this one petition that he offered to the Father. He said, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world would know that you sent me. And loved them, even as you loved me. See, Jesus is saying there that the very glory that we have as Christians is our unity. Our unity in Christ, and that unity is expressed in our love for one another. In fact, earlier that very evening, in John chapter 13, he told his disciples, By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Again, doctrine is important. Doctrine is necessary. 
But true doctrine leads us to Christ, who is love. And as as doctrine draws us into a loving relationship with Christ, we show his love to one another. My friends, listen, if you're not showing love, then you really don't know Christ. Even if your profession is orthodox. Paul brings this out in 1 Corinthians 13, right? If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. Paul pointed out that that your knowledge of doctrine is only a benefit to you when it shows itself in love. This is also reiterated in 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 16. We know, love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and see his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know this, that we are of the truth by our love for one another. Uh, see, and this is what concerned Jesus. Their lack of love affected, really, their testimony to the world. You know something? The world will not pay attention to our doctrine if we don't live lovingly. The world will look upon us with befuddled amusement as we debate the issues of six-day creation or our total depravity. But it will understand a people who are caring and gentle with one another. They may not get the importance of Sabbatarianism, but they cannot deny the power of a love that works forgiveness into the hearts of those who are broken. In the third century, the great uh, Roman lawyer turned uh, converted as a Christian wrote an apology to, to the emperor of Rome calling for the persecutions to end. And one of the things that he wrote in there, he says, it is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. See, they say, how they love one another. Well, they themselves are animated by mutual hatred, how they are ready even to die for one another, for they themselves will sooner be put to death. In other words, He he was saying, look at how the world, look at how the Romans are hating one another. The unbelievers, the pagans hate one another. They will tear one another apart, but they see the church and they say, see, they love one another. The love of the Christians was so evident that even the unbelievers could recognize it. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25, Paul admonished Timothy again to fight for the doctrine. Still, he says, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. That's love in action, right? uh, Love adores God, and it upholds his truth without compromise. But it gently also seeks to correct others by announcing to them God's love for sinners. And so Jesus here commends the Ephesians for their toil, for their perseverance in fighting against false teaching, false apostles. But now he calls them to be just as diligent to toil and persevere in loving others. In fact, the apostle Paul, their first pastor, wrote to them in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. He says, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. See, and again, what, what Paul and what Jesus is calling the church to do is to persevere in unity and love. 
That word diligent means to toil, to labor hard at, to do one's best in the task. Don't be half-hearted about it. Give yourself over fully to, to bearing one another's burdens, showing hospitality, supplying the needs of others, praying for one another. Be zealous in loving one another because Christ died, not only to save you, but then too. And so Jesus, again, exposes our sin. Of course, it's all for good purpose, isn't it? Hebrews 12 says all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. No, of course, it's sorrowful. But to those who have been trained by it, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And so Jesus didn't just point out their sin and their failing. He shows them what they need to do to fix this issue. And so verse 5 the first thing he tells them to do is remember from where you have fallen. That's the first step to recovery. That they might know the joy of their salvation. Remember from where you fall. Now, now notice that he doesn't tell them to re remember the deeds that they used to do. But to remember where they have fallen. That's a very important distinction, I think. Again, your love for others is related to your love to God. Remember how Jesus said the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said the second is like the first, and that your love to your neighbor is related to your love to God. Your love to your neighbor is a reflection of your love for God. Again, Jesus, or John brought that out in his first epistle, chapter 4, where he said, the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. <laughs> When you forget his love, you will forget to love others. And so what Jesus is doing is calling us to remember his love. Remember his love. Remember how his love changed your life. Remember how his love, when it first entered to your heart, and you, you saw yourself as a rotten, stinking sinner, and suddenly his love opened up a, a new vista for you where, where you saw that your sins are forgiven, and that he brought you into his fold. Now you're the children of God. And as children of God, now you're reconciled to others. Amazingly, once we're in Christ, all those things that divided us don't matter. I find it a most amazing thing. There he talked about Jews and Gentiles, uh, female, males, uh, bond, free. But we can even take it here. You know, I, I found it amazing one time. I was in a worship service, and sitting next to each other was a Korean and a Japanese. Now, you may not think much about that, but huh, the Japanese tortured Koreans. There's a hatred. I've I seen Armenians and Turks worshiping together in love. I've seen blacks and whites. All those things that would divide us in the world have now been put aside and in Christ we're now one, we're reconciled and we don't see color, we don't see nationality, we don't see economic status. What we see is brothers and sisters in the Lord who have the same love in their hearts as we do. Call, Christ calls us to remember his lavish grace and, and to remember how he saved us from the depths of our sin, from the wrath of God, that, that wrath that we deserved. And remembering that love. How can a heart not melt? If he forgave you, you who were his enemies, and I showed to you the heights, the depths, the length and his love and breadth of his great love for you in Christ. How can you withhold that love to others? That's what Jesus is calling us to. Remember from what you have fallen. Remember his love. Remember he saved you. He showed you mercy. Now show love and mercy to others. That's what Jesus means here when he says repent and do the first deeds. That repentance is, is to throw yourself upon him apprehending his abundant mercy and grace and his quick willingness to forgive. 
The call to repentance is to show a greater love, a greater obedience, and a, and a stronger fidelity. All which flows, it can only flow from the grace of God given to you. The God who forgives, the God who enables. So here we're called to remember his love, we're called to be renewed in his love. We're called now to show that love. Look at verse 7. He gives a promise to those who hear and obey him. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The repentance and the demonstration of this love is the overcoming. It's the victory of faith. Now, again, you might think that this promise to overcome is all up to you. If you persevere, if you conquer, you'll reach glory. But that's not what Jesus is holding out here. Again, going back to chapter 1 and verse 9, Jesus is the one who's already conquered, and we're called into fellowship with him. We're called to his victory. And so we conquer only because Christ conquered for us. And he is with us by his spirit to enable us to enter into that same victory. See, Jesus holds in his hand the churches. He's walking with us, living among us, pacing back and forth, tending to our needs, uh, uh, trimming our wicks, as it were. In other words, he doesn't forsake us, but he empowers us to do what he calls us to do. He then is the ever-present help in the time of need. So you're looking at yourself and saying, well, I don't know if I can love. Loving is hard. It's difficult. Some of you are easy to love. Some of you are not. I'm one of those that are not. I, I get that. But when you see other people under the cross, and you know that Jesus is with you, See, Jesus here is promising to take you into glory. Again, his love is not just something revealed for the past. It's not only for the present. His love is for the future. And he's taken us into this most blessed place to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He loved you unto death. He loves you now. He loves you in eternity. And he brings you to the tree of life as a promise. He's, he's reminding us, Adam failed to obey God. Adam failed to do what he was called to do, wasn't he? And, and because of that, he didn't earn the right to eat of the tree of life. He was barred from that. And you know your own sin, how you can never earn that reward in your own faulty righteousness, but Christ has earned it for you. He's earned it for you. The imperishable inheritance is what Christ died to give to you. And so this Lord who holds his church in his hand, who walks in their midst, he says to his failing church, do not fear, I am the living one. I hold you, I provide for you, I protect you, and I will be with you even to the end of the age. So receive this great love. It's a blessed thing. But then now, having received it, let it, let it flow out. Don't damn it up, but let it flow out to others. Again, sometimes it hurts to love. Sometimes it's painful to show grace to others. But here, Jesus is reminding you that the present suffering won't compare to the glory that awaits you. That is our hope. And this is what spurs us on, to live a life of love that glorifies him. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this letter that you gave to your church, Lord. What a great reminder it is that that though you love purity of doctrine, though you love purity of life and morality, yet, O oh Lord, you want us to live beyond that, just going into love, loving one another, caring for one another, showing mercy and forgiveness to one another, bearing one another's burdens, O oh Lord. Uh, I, I thank you, Lord, that this is a, a church that demonstrates that. But, Lord, can we not do it more? Let us never rest upon past laurels. But let us, Lord, always to press forward, forward with your grace, knowing that our Savior by his Spirit is with us always and that he will enable us to do what he calls us to do 
Give us those ears to hear what the Spirit does say. And let us live accordingly. For Christ's sake, and in his name, amen. Well, let's uh, stand and sing our closing hymn. It's 426. How vast the benefits divine, 426. Hmm. <laughs> There we shall reign with him forever and ever. Reign with him in perfection. The perfect, in the beauty of holiness. That's the promise that's held out to you. It's an interesting thing in Romans chapter 8. It, it says that uh, those who he's called, past tense, he's justified. And those who he has justified, past tense, he has glorified, past tense. Our glorification is as just, as secure as our justification is. Our glorification is just as secure because we're in his hand. And he's bearing us up in our midst. Look up then as you go from here back into the world to, to live as his witnesses with his blessings. Now the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. Amen. In your bulletin, you'll see our response of him is number 100A. Let's sing that together as we close. Shout to the Lord and make a joyful Thank you.